I will present some, uh, some shape optimization problems. Uh, they are optimization problems, but uh, they can be seen as uh, uh, optimal control problems, where the control variable is a domain. Uh, so you will see there is a state equation, a PD, an elliptic uh, PD in my case, and uh, the control variable is the domain. So we are free to move the domain in some uh, appropriate way to achieve uh, some uh, uh, minimal cost. So the, the field of uh, shape optimization problem is very, is very large, very general. So there is a, uh, a shape functional, capital F, which depends on a domain, omega. So this is the cost. And uh, uh, the domain omega varies in some reasonable class, the admissible class of domains. So uh, many cases enter in, into this very general framework, but in, in particular, I will be interested in two main uh, classes uh, of uh, cost functionals. The first one I called uh, integral functionals and the second one, spectral functionals. Let me shortly describe these two classes. So integral functionals is exactly as in uh, optimal control theory. Uh, there is, a, there is a, the state equation, you see. F, f of x is a given right-hand side, in L2, for instance, in L2. And everything occurs in a big uh, domain D. D is fixed, it's a very big box, and everything uh, occurs inside uh, this D. So uh, this F is given. So uh, this is the control, omega is the control variable, and this is a state equation. So for each value of the control, you solve uh, this elliptic equation in a unique way, in a unique solution. And uh, you take this solution and you plug in, into this integral. This is a uh, standard integral functional with the function which depends on x, on u, and on grad u. And you plug instead of u the solution of the state equation. And so this provides uh, the, the functional, the cost functional that you want to minimize. So on the, on the function j, very, very mild conditions are required. Okay, this, uh, in general, this j is positive, I mean, but you may allow very, very mild condition to treat uh, this uh, problem. I, I don't mean uh, that uh, uh, a solution exists, just to, to, to be meaningful, the problem to be meaningful. So uh, as a prototype, you can think to this one. This is a very good uh, integral function, is the energy. The energy of the system. Uh, and the energy of the, of, of the system is written in this way. You minimize the Dirichlet energy. Huh? One half grad u square minus the linear part f times u. And you minimize with zero boundary. Con in this case, uh, just to fix the idea, I'm speaking about the Dirichlet uh, condition. You will see that uh, there is a quite big difference between uh, these two persons, <laughs> Dirichlet and Neumann. Very big difference. So uh, Dirichlet is uh, easier in this, in this sense. And so this uh, I call the energy of uh, the domain omega. So you would say why this is a prototype of integral function? This is rather easy because you write uh, the Euler-Lagrange equation, just integration by parts, standard, uh, the standard way, and you end up with this, uh, you can write this energy in this form. And it's very easy, just an integration by part. And so the energy is written as uh, minus one half the integral of f times the solution. And so this is ex exactly the form of uh, the integral functional before this, this one, 
where uh, you simply take uh, this uh, j function as uh, one half minus one half f of x times uh, s. S is the variable for u. So this is a very nice prototype for integral function. But the class is much, much larger. Uh, another interesting, very interesting class uh, uh, is the class of spectral functionals. And spectral function, again, I take the minus Laplacian as a, the elliptic operator to deal with. So you take the, the Dirichlet Laplacian minus delta on H10 on omega. Omega is, a, is the control variable again. So uh, it is uh, very well known that if omega has a finite measure, uh, then uh, uh, the minus Laplacian has a compact resolvent, and then the, the spectrum is discrete. And, and so I can draw the spectrum uh, uh, as a sequence, lambda 1 omega, lambda 2 omega, lambda 3, and so on, of eigenvalues. So uh, I mean by spectral functional, <coughs> any function of the spectrum. So take your favorite function uh, phi and uh, mix a uh, little bit the eigenvalues. And this is a, a real number that I call capital F of omega. And everything depends only on omega. You move omega, the spectrum varies, and then the cost. Again, uh, on this function phi, very, very little assumptions are required, continuity, is very, very simple. Prototype, again, as a prototype, you can take this one, lambda k. You fix a k, I don't know, equal 3, 4, or 20, what you want. And, uh, and this is a very nice prototype of a spectral function. One one. One is a, it's a, very, good, it's a very good case, k equal 1. OK, uh, so this is uh, the class, uh, the two classes I, I want to consider. So what about the admissible class in which uh, the domain may vary? Well, also in this case, uh, uh, there are many possible choices. I should say that uh, as soon as you add uh, even very little geometrical properties on the admissible domains, this uh, gives you the existence of a solution in a quite easy way. So let's think, for instance, uh, you, you say that the admissible class, you want to consider only convex domains. So convexity is a very strong uh, assumption. This gives you a lot of compactness. And so this is enough to obtain the existence of an optimal domain for all these cases, almost for free. So you may say that convexity is a too strong assumption. You could weaken a little bit, saying, well, I am only interested in equilipschitz function, equilipschitz domain, where you fix uh, the Lipschitz constant. Again, this is a quite strict class. Uh, you get uh, the good compactness that you need, and all these problems admit an optimal domain. And you can weaken, weaken, and weaken these uh, geometric assumptions. For instance, another one weaker than equilipschitz is the exterior cone, the uniform exterior cone condition. Uh, in, in this case, you require to the admissible domains to have uh, a uniform condition of exterior cone. So in each point of the boundary, uh, the, a fixed cone with a fixed opening and fixed height must uh, be around the boundary. And again, this is enough for compactness. Uh, also, another weaker condition is the uniform exterior flat cone. You don't need that the cone to turn around the boundary be n-dimensional. It is enough to be n minus 1 dimensional. So in dimension two, this is called the segment property. In dimension two, 
uh, n minus one dimension is a segment. So it is enough you turn a segment around the boundary and this is enough to give uh, the good compactness to get a solution for every of this problem. All this problem admits a solution. But we don't want to do that. We want to put only a very, very natural and weak uh, assumption, which is fixing the Lebesgue measure. The Lebesgue measure does not give any compactness in this case. So in all the rest, uh, I will not assume geometric assumptions on the competing domains, but only the Lebesgue measure is fixed. And this gives a lot of difficulties, and most of the problems above don't have a solution. If you only fix the Lebesgue measure, uh, it is very difficult to have a solution, because in most of the situation, the domain has uh, the interest to split into many, many pieces, and then uh, uh, the homogenization comes in, and uh, in many of these cases, homogenization is better than uh, classical domains. But not for all problems, and I will discuss exactly the problems in which, even if you don't uh, assume a geometric uh, constraint, but only the Lebesgue measure, nevertheless, the problem is uh, so good that uh, uh, a solution domain, classical domain, exists. Now the problem uh, is uh, what do we assume on the free boundary? Free boundary is the boundary of uh, the unknown domain omega. So uh, we may assume one of the several possible boundary conditions. I will concentrate mainly in, uh, in, the, two, in the two main ones, Dirichlet and Neumann, but of course you may consider Robin or other so let's fix the idea Dirichlet and Neumann. And the behavior of these two conditions is, uh, is extremely different, you will see. So also I use often the word domain just uh, to, be, to be vague on this. Uh. So usually uh, when we speak about domains, people uh, uh, understand the open sets. But this is not a good uh, definition in this case. In this case, you should weaken a little bit the concept of open set, because we are dealing with minus, La minus Laplacian. Minus Laplacian operator likes a lot uh, the Sobolev spaces. And uh, Sobolev functions are not continuous. So this is why you should define as a domain what is called uh, quasi-open set. Quasi-open set, uh, uh, just to, to be simple, quasi-open set is a, is a sub-level of a Sobolev function, which in general is not open. So open sets are sub-level of Lipschitz functions. And uh, quasi-open sets are sub-level of uh, Sobolev function. So there is a slight difference between quasi-open and, and open. Of course, a very interesting issue, but this is very hard. This is very hard in the most of the situation. This is uh, an open question. You, you will see I will provide some uh, existence uh, theorem about optimal domains in some cases. And then the next uh, step would be prove or disprove, but I, I believe prove, <laughs> uh, that uh, the optimal solution are better than quasi-open sets, uh, open, maybe also regular, smooth. But uh, this step uh, is uh, still, uh, in most of the situations, uh, unsolved. Of course, people expect. In, uh, in natural problems, very natural problems, expect uh, that the solution be rather smooth. 
Uh, but in many cases, uh, uh, the only available existence result in the, is in the class of quasi-open sets. So this is a, a rather old result. Uh, I should say, in this generality, still unbeaten. <laughs> uh, that I, I got with Dalmasa in '93, and uh, uh, the result is very clean, and says that uh, there is a class of cost functionals for which a classical domain solution exists. Because in general, uh, as I said, you should expect that homogenized domain, domains are better. In most of the situation, this is what uh, uh, generally happens. The homogenized uh, solution, I should describe what homogenized solutions are, but this is not uh, uh, my goal. Uh, but uh, there is a certain interesting class for which optimal domains exist. And uh, this class is described by the, this theorem. You see the assumptions are very clean, very simple. Uh, two, two assumptions are uh, needed for this theorem. The first one is the cost uh, is monotone decreasing. This is very severe. I mean, this applies only to a very restricted class of uh, cost functionals. The co we, we shall see that uh, some interesting cases fall into, into this framework. So the cost is monotone decreasing for the set inclusion. For, so smaller are the set, uh, bigger uh, is uh, the cost. And this is a very severe assumption. The second one, uh, well, I don't want to describe, but this is, uh, uh, this is very, very mild uh, assumption. This is always satisfied. Because uh, this gamma, so the, the function is required to be gamma lower semicontinuum, but this gamma, small gamma conversion is extremely strong. This is the, conver the strong convergence of the resolvent operator. So this is extremely strong. And so the, the second assumption is always satisfied in, mo in all the interesting cases. So don't care about the second one. So the strong convergence of resolvent, in particular, gives the convergence of the spectrum. And so all the spectral functionals are continuous for this convergence. So this is why I don't care about the second one. The, the, the severe one is the first. Monotonicity is required on the cost. And then uh, the, the conclusion is that uh, the shape optimization here with only the Lebesgue measure con constraint, only on the Lebesgue measure, no other geometrical constraint, admits uh, a domain as a solution. So, uh, as I said, uh, once you get uh, the existence of, of an optimal domain, uh, a very good question would be, can we say more? Necessary conditions of optimality, regularity, smoothness, um, qualitative, uh, but very little is known. Because in order to perform the boundary variation, you would need a little bit of regularity. And this is uh, not, uh, uh, apart some very, very particular cases, this is uh, not uh, known. Uh, other variants, so here you see uh, this theorem has these assumptions, but also uh, the domain uh, is included into this big box, which is uh, a priori fixed, this D. Everything occurs inside D, and D is a bounded uh, box. So other variants uh, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, <laughs> result, so this is uh, <coughs> quite interesting. What happens when D is the entire space? And uh, you can uh, easily imagine that question of compactness uh, occur. So you would need some, some, uh, uh, 
some arguments uh, to, to avoid pieces of the domain, to escape to infinity. But this has been done by these authors, Bukur, Mazzoleni, Pratelli, Velichkov. And then uh, another uh, interesting issue in this uh, case of the entire space is show that uh, optimal sets are bounded. Because in principle, they, they may have a very long uh, necks. Uh, but uh, in some cases, uh, it can be shown that uh, the optimal sets are bounded and uh, they have a finite perimeter, which is a little bit, but this is not yet the finite perimeter is a good, uh, is a good thing, but uh, you don't have to, uh, to expect that from finite perimeter you reach regularity in, in a in an easy way. And in some very particular cases uh, of functionals, uh, the optimal domains are open. This happens, for instance, with lambda 1, the first eigenvalue. If you deal with the first eigenvalue, you can show that uh, the optimal domains are open. And in, in the case of lambda 1, they are also smooth. But if you take, instead of lambda 1, lambda 2, the second eigenvalue, this is not known. Of course, people expect yes, but no proofs uh, at the moment. So uh, what about uh, the monotonicity assumptions? Do we have interesting cases in which the cost function is uh, monotonically decreasing? The answer is yes. And uh, all spectral functionals where you mix the eigenvalues in some increasing way, they are actually decreasing. Eigenvalues themselves are decreasing. This is very well known. If you have a bigger domain, uh, the spectrum shifts on the, on the left. If you increase the domain, the spectrum goes on the left. And this gives uh, the uh, monotonicity, the decre decreasing monotonicity. And so as a consequence, all spectral functionals which have this property, you mix the eigenvalue, eigenvalues in some increasing way, all these functionals uh, have an optimal domain. For instance, you can say lambda 7 times uh, lambda 5 plus uh, lambda 13. In this case, you are mixing eigenvalues in an increasing way. The function is increasing with respect to the lambda j. And so the global function is decreasing. And so you may apply the theorem above. So uh, the energy is another good uh, example. So there are, uh, the natural example fulfills this uh, uh, monotonicity uh, Hypothesis, a functional, on the contrary, which is not of this uh, class, which is interesting, but not of this class, is the following, which occurs in, uh, in the control of temperature of some uh, reactor, or nuclear plants, or whatever. So uh, you have the desired temperature, the, the, the optimal temperature at which the, the machine works. So let's let call U uh, desired. This is given. You know, it's a certain temperature you want to reach. And the cost functional is simply this one. So you want to be as close as possible in the L2 sense to a desired temperature. And what is the control? You can control the region where u equals 0 okay? by putting some refrigerators or some thermostatic device. So this is the equation. You, you can think u is a temperature. And uh, you, uh, your control is K. 
u equals zero on k. So this problem is of the form above, just call omega equal d minus k, you call omega, and you are in the framework above. But this function is not decreasing with respect to the domain, is not. So this is u sub k, because this depends on k. And in this case, an optimal solution does not exist. In this case, homogenization is uh, much better. So the interest for k is to split in many, many small pieces. And you put the Dirichlet condition on, on each pieces, in each of the pieces. So this is a, a nice example, rather natural, in which uh, an optimal domain does not exist. And in this case, uh, when an optimal domain does not exist, you should go into the larger family of relaxed domain, which can be obtained by homogenization. And these relaxed domain are fully characterized, and they are the so-called capacitary measures. In a simple, uh, roughly speaking, you may think about capacitary measures. Radon measures, or Borel measures, which are absolutely continuous with respect to the capacity. They are zero when the capacity is zero. And for instance, the Dirac delta in dimension two is not. Is not a capacitary measure. A line uh, in dimension two is a capacitary measure, but the Dirac delta is not. And so this uh, will be a long discussion about relaxed problem, homogenization, and so on. But uh, now let us focus on our uh, Dirichlet and Neumann uh, uh, problems. So I will consider two cases, and you will see they are quite different. In the first, so uh, on the boundary of the unknown domain, I will put both conditions, Dirichlet on one part and Neumann in another one. So all the difficulty arises when I have to say which part is free and which part is fixed. And so you will see, uh, in the first one, I will treat the, the easy case in which, in which uh, the, the Neumann condition acts uh, on a fixed part and uh, the Dirichlet part is, on the contrary, free. This is the easy case because uh, on the free, the free part, of course, is the difficult one. On the, on the free part, I will put the Dirichlet condition. So in this case, uh, everything works well. And the second one is the, the opposite. I consider the Dirichlet condition on a fixed part and uh, the Neumann condition, the free one. And this is much more difficult. The reason of this difficulty is the following. If you uh, consider the Dirichlet condition, the Dirichlet condition provides you cost functionals which are decreasing. Because of the reason I said before, uh, if you have uh, a larger domain, the spectrum with Dirichlet condition shifts on the left. This is not anymore true for Neumann. With Neumann, you don't have any monotonicity, neither decreasing nor increasing. So everything behaves in a wild, uh, quite wild uh, way. So let's see the first, the, the easy case. Fixed Neumann and free Dirichlet. And so uh, you will see that uh, there is not a big difference with respect to the previous one in which all the boundary was Dirichlet type. So more or less the, the result is the same. So uh, you should imagine a situation like uh, this. Uh, so in this part we have Neumann. And this is fixed. This is given a priori. And your domain uh, is like that, and you are free to choose this one. Okay? 
but this one is fixed. And uh, the result uh, is uh, not very different from the previous. You need some uh, little bit uh, of uh, technicalities. So it is simple if you look at the PD is minus delta U equal F in, the, in uh, omega. U equals zero on the boundary which touch uh, this part and uh, the u dn equals zero on the other one. So this is uh, the PD. And again, uh, you take the solution, you plug into the, the cost function, or if you want to consider the spectral case, you consider the eigenvalues. So this is, for instance, the first eigenvalue. The first eigenvalue is uh, this one, the usual uh, gradius square with the L2 norm equal 1, but now you minimize on this uh, H10 omega relative to D. Relative to D means that you do not count, uh, you do not count this part. You count only what is uh, uh, interior to D. And uh, the result is very similar to the the previous one. You just need a little bit of changes, but uh, essentially is the same. So uh, all these cases admit a solution, provide a classical solution, dom domain solution, provide uh, similar assumptions are satisfied. So the, the cost is monotone decreasing for the set inclusion, and this is the severe assumption. And this other one, which is very, very mild. Gamma D is uh, the gamma convergent tuned on the set D in the sense I said before where you do not count uh, this uh, normal part. This looks, uh, this looks like uh, if, you, if you replace the Dirichlet integral, integral gradius square, but by the integral gradius power 1, this is exactly what is called uh, the Dido problem. Because if you replace the Dirichlet integral by gradu power 1, you get the perimeter. And this is exactly the Dido problem. In the Dido problem, you count the length of this curve without counting the cost. In the Dido problem, this represents the cost. The cost. Uh, the Queen Dido did not care about the cost, but only the interior part. And so this is why, with my student uh, Velichkov, we called uh, this uh, spectral drop problem. Because in the usual drops, the cost function which is involved is the perimeter. And here uh, is something spectral. So this is why we call spectral drop problem. So in the spectral drop, we pay the Dirichlet part, but we don't pay the Neumann, and the Neumann is fixed. And in this case, a solution exists. You can show uh, for lambda 1. Let, uh, let us take lambda 1, which is a very good functional. For lambda 1, you can show a lot of interesting facts. So this is the box D. The box D is a big one. Big, this is, and so this is omega. Uh, for the spectral drop, several interesting facts uh, occur. First of all, the optimal domain, which exists because lambda 1 is decreasing, so no problem f to apply the uh, theorem above. Uh, the optimal domain must touch the boundary of D. So the interest of the domain is to use as much as possible the Neumann part, because the Neumann part is free. You don't pay this. You pay only the Dirichlet one. And so the domain try, try to move uh, to the boundary. And the better, you can uh, not only touch the boundary, but touch the boundary in a good way. So the d minus 1 dimension of the intersection is strictly positive as in the picture. 
A second fact which is interesting uh, is that the boundary of uh, the optimal set intersects the boundary of D orthogonally, more or less like in this picture. These two intersections are 90 degrees. And uh, so this is uh, what happens in the case of uh, a bounded box D. And then we say, well, what happens if D is unbounded? Uh, in, the, in the case D unbounded, there are two situations. One, uh, which is the following, take uh, uh, a convex uh, unbounded set and assume that D is this one. In this case, again, you can prove, even if D is unbounded, in this case, an optimal uh, domain exists, uh, and probably the optimal domain will take advantage of this part and will be located probably something like so. This is the optimal omega. On the contrary, if you take as D the complement, in this case, an optimal solution does not exist because the optimal domains try to escape uh, at infinity. They, uh, they want to take advantage of the flat boundary, and flat boundary, of course, more you go to infinity, more the boundary becomes flat. So there is a sequence of domains escaping at infinity, and in this case, you don't get an optimal solution. So with unbounded sets, D everything <laughs> Uh, may occur. But with bounded set D, uh, everything is clear. Another interesting situation is uh, when uh, D is the complement of uh, a bounded set. And in this case, you get always existence. So there is uh, here an obstacle, a bounded obstacle, and D is the complement. In this case, an optimal solution exists and uh, is also bounded. So the optimal solution uh, will be probably something like so. So this is uh, so the optimal spectral drop is this one. So another variant uh, consists uh, as in the drop problem. In the drop problem, you, you can add uh, this uh, quantity, and this uh, provides a different uh, contact angle. In the case of uh, usual drops, this gives the contact angle. And in this case, you can do the same by adding uh, this term, the integral of u squared on the boundary, and uh, instead of having uh, Dirichlet Neumann, in that case, you have Dirichlet Robin, of course, because uh, here this K provides a Robin condition on the, on the fixed part. But uh, the, the analysis uh, is uh, more or less the same. And of course, uh, the, the orthogonality condition on the, on the contact points is not anymore true. It depends on K in that case. Now the difficult part. <laughs> Fix uh, Dirichlet and free Neumann. I don't know, the two persons, uh, Dirichlet and Neumann, <laughs> we should look at the biography. In this sense, uh, Dirichlet is uh, very good, <laughs> Neumann is very nasty. <laughs> I don't know if this corresponded <laughs> to the character of persons. <coughs> so in this case, uh, uh, just the opposite occurs. So now uh, there is a fixed Dirichlet part, which is this one. And the free one is Neumann. So just uh, The picture is the same, just you reverse the, the two parts of the boundary. And uh, this one is fixed. And uh, the free Neumann uh, has to be 
found. In this case, uh, I don't have a general theorems to show you. There are no. The reason is, uh, as I said, the lack of monotonicity. Uh, just to, to fix uh, the idea, even for lambda 1, the simplest case, lambda 1, in a box, uh, we are unable to show that an optimal domain exists. Of course, uh, without the box, it is very well known that the optimal domain for lambda 1 in Neumann is the ball. This is known by special tricks, uh, symmetrization. But as soon as you are in a box, the symmetrization does not uh, work anymore. And uh, of course, we expect a solution exists. But you cannot apply these methods. So this is a good question. You are in a box. Domains uh, are constrained to be in a box. The volume is prescribed. Of course, if, if the volume is too small, the ball uh, uh, is unbeatable. This is, this is known. But assume the volume is not so small and uh, is not so small that the ball does not fit in a box. In that case, uh, I would expect a solution exists, but uh, no proofs uh, at the moment are available. So the PD is uh, for, uh, for mu1. Let's take mu1. Mu1 is the first eigenvalue of uh, the Neumann Dirichlet, fixed Dirichlet and free Neumann. Let's call mu1. And so uh, mu1 fulfills this uh, PD minus delta u equal mu1 times u in omega, and u equals 0 on k, and uh, the u dn equals 0 on uh, the boundary. So this is the mixed. Uh, Dirichlet Neumann. And uh, I use the word optimize, but optimize, of course, in the Dirichlet case means minimize, but in the Neumann case means maximize. Because if you try to minimize mu1, the solution is trivial, you get zero. It is enough to split the domain in two disconnected uh, components, and you get immediately zero. So the good problem for mu1 is the, the maximization. So you want to maximize mu1 under Lebesgue measure constraint and this uh, mixed uh, Dirichlet-Neumann condition. So this is, a, this is the problem. Maximize mu1 with this condition. Uh, so it is more convenient to take uh, the dual formulation, uh, which means uh, maximize the measure under the mu1 constraint. It's the same. As in the case of the drop, uh, you may uh, minimize the perimeter with fixed measure or maximize the measure with fixed perimeter. It's the same. So instead of maximize mu1, I maximize the measure with the the mu1 constraint. And this, uh, this uh, has an advantage because uh, uh, this is very easy to show that this infimum is uh, either 0 or minus infinity. It depends on this mu. If, if this mu is big, it is clearly minus infinity because the L2 norm uh, is, is, bet is larger than the gradius square. And uh, if mu is below mu1, this is 0, because you just get uh, uh, this. Uh, well, this is clear. So since uh, this infimum is either 0 or minus infinity, I can rewrite this uh, dual uh, problem as a max min. So I maximize with respect to omega the minimum on u of the measure of omega plus uh, this. Because this is either 0 or minus infinity. It is 0 when the constraint is fulfilled. It is minus infinity otherwise. And so this is exactly the formulation above. But now the advantage of this formulation is that some computation can be done 
So first of all, I can uh, interchange the min and max. This is not always possible, but in this case it is. Uh, so you can find a lot of theorems about uh, interchanging the min and the max. You need some convexity in some variable, uh, which is true here. And uh, you, you need the compactness in the other one. Anyway, this can be done. So uh, if you interchange, this is the new, uh, the new quantity you have to deal with. But now you see that the maximum with respect to omega is easy to compute. The minimum with respect to u is not. But the maximum with respect to omega, you see, this is the, the new problem you get. And this max is easy. Why it is easy? I can take a, a, an even larger problem, replacing the, the indicator function of omega by a function theta between 0 and 1. In such a way, the measure of omega becomes the integral of theta. And here, the integral of omega will be the integral on the entire box of theta times this. This very simple uh, substitution. So this is the, the new problem, which is even larger. The maximization is, in principle, larger. So this, uh, this was before the measure of omega, and now is the integral of theta. And uh, before it was the integral over omega, and now it is the integral over all d of theta times this. And now the max with respect to theta is very easy to compute. And you end up with this uh, quantity. Now the theta has been eliminated. This is uh, the new quantity you get. And so you end up uh, with the auxiliary problem where only the variable u appears. And the auxiliary problem is this one. This problem is very easy to show that uh, admits an optimal solution u bar. And so uh, the candidate uh, optimal domain omega bar is the set where this uh, quantity is strictly positive. So this is the idea. Take this auxiliary problem, solve it. This provides you an optimal function u bar. And then through u bar, you, uh, you may define the candidate optimal set, which is the set where this quantity is strictly positive. You see from here that no regularity is uh, uh, for free on omega bar, because omega bar is a set where a measurable function is positive. So in principle, uh, this does not provide you any regularity for free. So now this is the candidate, how to show that this is a good, uh, the good one. And so this is the theorem. Uh, the auxiliary problem above is in fact equivalent to a double obstacle problem, which has been uh, uh, very deeply studied in the literature. So this was the auxiliary problem. And so this auxiliary problem is completely equivalent to a double ob obstacle problem, where you see the positive part disappears, but the double obstacle, 0 and 1, are the two obstacles, uh, appear now. So uh, this is the standard double obstacle problem. And this has a solution. And this solution is known to be good. And uh, now the optimal set is the set where the solution does not touch the upper obstacle. So this is a quite involved trick, which works only in this uh, mu1 case. I cannot repeat the same trick in more general case. But for mu1, this works well. And now you can show the properties of a solution. So uh, if the, the Dirichlet fixed part is a ball, 
So assume that this, uh, this part is a ball of radius uh, R0, then uh, uh, the optimal domain is a ball of radius, uh, a convenient uh, radius that you can compute uh, explicitly. If uh, this is bound, okay, this is upper, uppercase K, is bounded, then the optimal set is bounded. The solution uh, W, but this is important, since in the double obstacle problem, the solutions are known to be continuous, this gives you for free that the optimal set is open. Because the optimal set is a set where the W bar is strictly less than one. So this is a very particular case in which this, uh, this happens. And uh, the regularity of uh, this optimal set Again, uh, is the same uh, that you get for uh, the double obstacle problem and uh, depends on K. You should not expect too high regularity, but some regularity is true in this case. And, uh, well, an another case which is very lucky uh, occurs, and uh, it is the so-called torsion case. In the torsion case, the right-hand side f is equal to 1 or to a constant. And in this case, you can repeat. You can repeat the trick uh, for mu1, the trick that uh, I showed for mu1. This works well again. But as soon as you, re uh, you replace the constant uh, 1 by f of x, the trick uh, does not work anymore. So for f of x, a variable L2 function, or even infinity, but not constant, I can't repeat uh, the same trick, uh, and uh, I don't know if an optimal solution exists. So I think I can stop here. Thank you for your attention. Questions, comments? In the, in the previous slide, you, uh, you, you say that uh, the regularity depends on K. Can you precise? You should not expect, uh, you should not expect uh, too much. Uh, because there are, there are cases uh, in which uh, uh, the optimal solution for obstacle problem is not regular, even if k is uh, infinity. And this happens, this happens, for instance, if you have uh, two disconnected parts, two balls, even two balls. This is uh, k. In this case, the solution may have a corner here. So in the double, this is very well known in the, obstacle, uh, in the double obstacle situation. And in fact, the re regularity occurs up to sets uh, of uh, uh, dimension uh, d minus 2, in this case. So the full regularity should not be expected. In control problem, when you uh, you look for the control problem in a subdomain, uh, does there exist? It's an evolution equation, but does there exist some kind of results which says where is the best well, subdomain uh, as I said, for some uh, cost function? Well, I, as I said, everything depends uh, very strongly on the cost function you consider. 
there are good uh, cost functionals, which are the monotone ones, the decre monotone decreasing ones, and there are other also very good functional, but not mono. For instance, the L2, that one, this is a very good, uh, very natural and good functional, but this is not monotone, and in this case, the optimal domain does not exist. So I guess the same should occur in the control problem. It, depend, it depends very, very strongly on the cost you have in mind. This uh, L2, L2 distance from a target uh, uh, is bad for this scale. For this. Other questions? No? So we can take... Thank you.